Hey everyone, I'll be talking about lecture 14, which is um, resonance structures and Lewis exceptions. Um, I'm going to be drawing a lot of Lewis structures, so I figured this format would be a little bit easier to follow along, so hopefully this works okay. Um, so just to start out, let's draw the Lewis structure for NO3-. minus. So we're going to just assume that everyone who's watching this already is pretty comfortable drawing Lewis structures. So we're going to start with our N in the middle, and then an oxygen, an oxygen, and an oxygen, right? If we do the math here, this is going to have 24 electrons, so that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, or 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, um, 20, 22, 24. So we have all our electrons, but you'll notice that our nitrogen atom in the middle doesn't have a full octet, and it wants a full octet. So if we move one of these um, lone pairs down to um, be a bonding, um, to be a pair of bonding electrons, that's going to give us an N in the middle, a double bond here, this oxygen with two pairs of lone pairs, and then the other two oxygens, each with three sets of lone pairs. So that's going to be our Lewis structure. This one on the right here is going to be our Lewis structure for NO3 minus. However, you'll notice that we could have moved one of these lone pairs up or one of these lone pairs up um, and left this one where it was. So that's going to look like N with a double bond here, single bond here, single bond here, and the lone pairs. Or we could also have this third scenario where our double bond is on the bottom right oxygen. And so all of these three um, structures are valid Lewis structures. Not, not one of them is better than the other three. And when we have a situation like this, these are called resonance structures. Um, you should have these brackets here denoting the charge, right? And these are all valid resonance structures for the NO3 minus um, molecule. And so the, um, the idea behind this is drawing the Lewis structures this way um, helps us have a clear idea of where the electrons are, or rather counting the electrons, and it helps us determine bond order. Because the way we can determine bond order here is we're going to do the number of bond pairs divided by the number of bond locations. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four bond pairs in one, two, three locations. That's going to be four divided by three, which is going to give us approximately 1.33. So the bond order for this NO bond in a NO3 minus molecule is going to be approximately 1.33. So the important thing to keep in mind with these resonance structures is that these structures don't actually exist, right? This isn't an electron that's jumping between these different bonds. In reality, this is more like um, bonds that are spread out over the molecule, right? If anyone's seen um, The Emperor's New Groove, um, the scene where um, Yzma's trying to poison the Emperor and Gronk... Um, messes up the poison he can't remember which cup it's in so he pours them all back into the same glass he shakes it up and he pours them back into the three glasses so now you've got a little bit of poison in all three glasses and that's kind of what's happening here is we've got a little bit of this extra bond we'll call it hanging out in all three of these locations um, and so if we wanted to draw a more accurate Lewis structure it would look something like this with the dotted line right on all of these to represent a single bond plus a little bit of a bond. Um, but that just becomes more difficult for calculating the, the bond order and for keeping track of how many, the elect how many electrons there are and where they are. So instead we draw these resonance structures and we recognize that each one of these is a valid re resonance structure that contributes to the actual structure. Another good example is ozone, which looks something like this, right? You've got, um, sorry, I'm 
doing this off the top of my head, kind of. Um, you've got something like this, right? Ozone is O3. But that double bond could also go on the other side and your molecule, your Lewis structure rather, would look like this. And so both of these are valid resonance structures for the um, ozone molecule. So why is this important? Why do we need to know what the resonance structures look like? Um, like I was saying before, these resonance structures don't actually represent what a molecule um, looks like in reality. <laughs> But based on the possible resonance structures for a molecule, we can figure out what um, an accurate representation of it would be. So let's take, for example, the CO2 molecule. So for the CO2 molecule, we're going to have carbon in the middle, oxygen on each side. We're going to have a double bond, double bond, and then two lone pairs on each oxygen. Um, if we do the math, that's going to be 12 electrons plus 4 for the carbon, so 16, and we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, so that's correct. But we could also draw it with a triple bond on one side, single, pair of lone, um, single lone pair, and then three lone pairs and a single bond on the other side. And this is going to give us, um, you know, still a correct Lewis structure because we have all the correct number of electrons. Um, or we could put the triple bond on the other side where we have three lone pairs over here, a single bond, three, a uh, triple bond here, and a single lone pair. So all three of these are valid Lewis structures for the carbon dioxide molecule, but this is where the idea of formal charges come into play. So when we're determining which Lewis structure contributes most to the actual um, molecule, the structure of the actual molecule, we have to look at what's called um, formal charge. So the way we calculate formal charge is to do the regular number of valence electrons minus the number of bonds and electrons. Double, or er, right, electrons and bonding pairs, bond pairs plus electrons. So what that means is we're going to look at carbon, for example. Carbon, if we look at our periodic table, usually has four valence electrons. And if we count, it has one, two, three, four bonds, no electrons. And so that's going to be four minus four. So carbon here has a formal charge of zero. If we look at the oxygen, it usually has six valence electrons, and if we count here, it has one, two bonds, and three, four, five, six electrons, so that also is going to have a formal charge of zero. Same thing over here. And so this Lewis structure, all of these atoms have a formal charge of zero. If we move on to this one, oxygen is going to have six regular valence electrons. In this case, it has one, two electrons, and three, four, five um, pairs. So that's going to be six minus five, giving us a charge of positive one. Our carbon still has a charge of zero because it has four minus four bonds. And this other oxygen is going to have six minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven giving us a formal charge of negative one. And then if we look at this resonance structure over here, this one's going to be the same thing, but the inverse, negative one on this oxygen, zero on the carbon, and positive one on our oxygen on the right. So the way we figure out which Lewis structure is going to contribute the most to our actual structure of our molecule is by minimizing the formal charge. If we can get the formal charge on all of the atoms to zero, that's going to be the, um, the Lewis structure that most accurately reflects reality. So for the case of carbon dioxide, this one right here is going to be our most correct Lewis structure. Now, there are cases when we won't be able to minimize the formal charge on the atoms, um, like going back to our NO3 minus example. So if we look at this one, up top we have oxygen with one, two, three, four, five, six 
So 6 minus 6 gives us a charge of 0. Nitrogen usually has 5 valence electrons, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4 bond pairs. So that's going to have a charge of plus 1. Oxygen here has 6 valence electrons normally, and now it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, giving us a charge of negative 1. And this oxygen is the same thing, so negative 1. So in this case, we only have one atom with no formal charge, and we have three atoms that do have a formal charge. But you'll notice um, two things. First of all, we've put our negative formal charge on the most electronegative atom. So oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, so we want to put our formal charge there. Um, you'll also notice that these formal charges add up to the overall charge of the molecule. So negative 1 cancels with this positive 1, leaving us with an overall charge of negative 1 for the molecule. And if we went through these other Lewis structures, we'd find the same thing, that we would have two negative charges, two negative formal charges on the oxygens and a positive formal charge on the nitrogen, giving us an overall charge, an overall negative charge. So that's why um, Lewis, or rather resonance structures are important because they help us determine um, which Lewis structure most accurately reflects the reality of a molecule. Um, so now that we've talked about that, we're going to talk about a few exceptions to um, our Lewis structures. So the first exception we're going to talk about, let's look at the example of BF3, boron trifluoride, I think it's called. I could be getting that wrong, but this video review isn't about naming molecules, so that's okay. But boron trifluoride is going to have um, three valence electrons for boron and 21 valence electrons from the fluorides. And so that's going to look like a boron in the middle attached to three fluorides. Um, now, let's say for the sake of example that we want to try to maximize, that we want to try to have a complete octet on all of our atoms. So we're going to put a double bond there so that we have two, four, six, eight valence electrons on the boron. And then we're going to fill up the rest of these octets. So that's going to be two, um, four, six, eight, and then two, four, six, eight, and then two, four, six, eight. Eight. So let's just double check. We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, um, 20, 22, 24. So that's the correct number of electrons. Um, but if we go ahead and take a look at our formal charges, fluorine usually has 7 valence electrons. So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's a formal charge of 0. Here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, formal charge of 0. If we look at our boron, it usually has um, three valence electrons, and now it has one, two, three, four pairs. That has a formal charge of negative one. And this fluorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, giving it a charge of a formal charge of positive one. So in this case, we haven't minimized our formal charges. We have two that have no formal charge, but the boron and the fluorine both have a formal charge, and we want to try to get rid of that. So the better Lewis structure here would be just like this, with a single bond to each fluoride or fluorine, and then three lone pairs. Now this is something that takes a little bit of practice, but you can kind of start to recognize patterns where um, atoms that have seven valence electrons are generally going to have a single bond and three pairs of three lone pairs of electrons because that will always give them a formal charge of zero right because we have seven minus one two three four five six seven formal charge of zero same thing here same thing here and then boron because it has three single bonds and it generally has three valence electrons is also going to have a formal charge of zero so this in this case would be the correct lewis structure but you'll notice that our boron doesn't have a complete octet so sometimes for smaller atoms, for atoms that don't typically have very many valence electrons, they're okay not having a full octet. So when you're drawing these Lewis structures, it's okay if you don't have your full octet on these atoms that are a lot smaller. I just repeated myself, said the same thing twice, but that's okay. We're doing this in one take. So 
Let's talk about our next exception by looking at this molecule right here, NO2. So we're going to have a nitrogen in the middle, two oxygens. Um, let's put a double bond on one of these oxygens. That's going to give us uh, two lone pairs and then three lone pairs on this other one. And if we do the math here, that's going to be 17 electrons. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 17. So you'll notice that typically when we're drawing Lewis structures, um, we draw the electrons in pairs, right? But in this case, because we have an odd number of electrons in the molecule, we're left with this single um, electron on our nitrogen. And so if we do the formal charges here, we'll notice that this has a formal charge of zero, our nitrogen has a formal charge of positive one, and our oxygen has a formal charge of negative one. So this is correct because we want our negative formal charge on the oxygen because it's most electronegative. And there's not really any way for us to get rid of this, um, this, this positive charge here. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm sorry. I said that incorrectly. So we could have this structure here where we have a single electron hanging out by itself on this oxygen and then we're gonna have a formal charge of zero, formal charge of um, zero, and a formal charge of zero. So this would be our correct Lewis structure. However, you'll notice we still have this lone electron hanging out by itself. So whenever we get a situation like this, this is what's called a free radical. And molecules that look like this, where they have a single electron hanging out by itself, are very reactive because they want to do anything they can to either get rid of or get something to attach to so that we can um, have a a full set of electrons so we don't have a single electron hanging out by itself. Um, the last, um, sorry, so this is called, this would be an example of an incomplete octet. And this would be an example of a free radical. So the last example we're going to look at, um, let's take, for example, SF6. So if we draw this Lewis structure, we're going to have a sulfur in the middle. And then we have six fluorines. So there's not really any way for us to draw this without us attaching all six of those um, fluorines to our sulfur atom. And so you'll notice this breaks our octet rule of having a total of eight electrons attached to any atom. But there's not any way for us to draw this without doing that. And if we do the math, you'll see that we have, um, let's see, that's going to be 48 electrons, if I'm not mistaken. And you can count up these electrons and see that we have 48 electrons here. So the reason this happens is because sulfur, um, if you look at your periodic table, is in your third row. So your n equals 3 row. And because of the larger size of sulfur, it has several um, orbitals that are big enough for it to fit extra electrons this way. So the octet rule that we talked about only applies to the first two rows on the periodic table and anything beyond that um, can expand its octet if it needs to. Another example would be xenon F4. So if we draw it, we've got four fluorines and then we put our electrons this gives all of our fluorines a um, formal charge of zero but then if we count up our electrons we're gonna have 28 from our fluorines and 8 from our xenon so that gives us 36 and we count here on our picture we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, um, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, uh, 30, 32, and we needed 36, right? So that means we have two more pairs, two more lone pairs of electrons that we haven't used, so we're just gonna 
tack those on to our xenon in the middle. And once again, um, the xenon has expanded its octet. It's gone beyond that, um, those eight electrons that it's allowed to have, but because it's not in the first two rows of the periodic table, it's big enough to handle those electrons. So anytime you have extra electrons or extra atoms that won't fit within the octet rule, and you've got a central atom that's big enough to handle them, you're gonna be able to break the octet rule. So this would be an example of what are called expanded octets. So just to summarize everything we talked about in this video, let's try to put together a concise little list here. We have resonance structures, And those contain what are called delocalized bonds, right? Which are those bonds that are kind of spread out over the whole molecule. And we draw them by drawing our molecule with arrows between the different resident structures, right? The different valid resonance structures. Um, we talked about formal charge. Oh, and one last thing on these resonance structures is we're going to calculate um, um, bond orders by doing the number of bond pairs divided by number of bond positions. Then for formal charge, we're going to calculate that by counting the number of normal valence electrons minus the number of bonds plus electrons on a given atom in a molecule. And this formal charge is important because the resonance structure that is most going to contribute to our actual structure is going to be the one with a minimized formal charge and once we've minimized the formal charge if we're stuck with any negative formal charges we need to put those on the most electronegative atom so let's write that by saying um, negative formal charge on most electro negative atom and then the exceptions we discussed were incomplete octets expanded octets and free radicals.